What I'm going to talk about today, uh, okay, here. Um, so I'm going to introduce who we are, what we do, and then I'm going to dive into the topic of chemical or offshore, and especially in the North Sea, uh, talk about the need for integration, um, the challenges, the specific challenges uh, that we face in the North Sea, and then um, I'll talk about hopefully some potential solutions and uh, go into some um, practical field examples. <laughs> so first of all, who we are, um, it's a uh, a group of three companies uh, that uh, I've joint ventured since 2011 to provide services on chemical and install recovery. Um, basically, uh, three companies, IFP, the French Petroleum Institute, now called IFP Energie Nouvelle, um, which has been around for 70 years, uh, doing research and development in uh, all segments of the oil and gas industry. Um, Solve, which is uh, uh, a big uh, Belgian company, uh, petrochemical company, they manufacture lots of chemicals and in particular surfactants. Um, they used to be called Rodia when we uh, partnered with them and then Solvay took them over um, a couple of years ago now. And then the last part, uh, the last partner is uh, Basip Front Lab, which is a 100% subsidiary of IFP and uh, they are um, reservoir engineers, geologists, consultants. So the three of us, we offer services. Um, Solvay basically uh, brings their knowledge of the surfactants, all their manufacturing capabilities uh, IFP brings the reservoir knowledge, uh, the core floods, and the basic front lab uh, brings the manpower in terms of geology, reservoir engineering, reservoir simulation. So chemical EOR, um, I'm not going to go into very many details, but uh, just to have everybody on the same playing field, uh, polymer, we have the, uh, a very good uh, description of what polymer is about, just here to make the water more viscous and improve the sweep and uh, the mobility ratio. Surfactant is a second key component of the whole thing. Um, surfactant will uh, reduce the interfacial tension between the water and the oil, and by doing that, it will um, reduce the, the capillary forces trapping oil in the reservoir and reduce the residual oil saturation. And the last element, uh, which is usually associated, is uh, alkali. Um, basically, um, it's there to generate surfactant in the reservoir in some cases, depending on the oil quality and also to uh, reduce the absorption of the surfactant in the reservoir. Um, so just uh, a recap of uh, the very, very few uh, chemical EOR projects that have taken place offshore. Uh, the ancestor is uh, Dos Quadras in California uh, in the 80s, um, was a, a polymer flood that was implemented there, um, but of course California is uh, not deep water, very sh close to the coast, so <clears throat> not the same challenges as in the North Sea. And then uh, lots of trials in Bohai Bay in China, both with polymer and ASP. Uh, Daria Angola with uh, Total, um, a very interesting uh, polymer project, and uh, I'll say a few words on it uh, later on. And then Enxi in Malaysia, alkali surfactant. Um, Captain, we just heard about, and then Snorer, of course, where they dig the, the foam-assisted uh, WAG uh, at a fairly large scale. So that's about it. Um, there is not much more. Um, so now, if we look at the typical onshore UR project, that's the way it, it usually goes. Um, you start with your pre-feasibility study, and then you do your laboratory design. For polymer, you screen the products. For surfactant, you do the formulation, which com consists in um, combining two or more surfactants plus the alkali, etc. Then you do your pilot design with the reservoir simulation, history match, um, etc. And then you go into the execution phase, which obviously is a, a capital. It's where you verify that everything you've been planning is, is really happening. And, and then if you are successful, and it's not always the case, obviously, uh, you go into the full field uh, deployment, uh, which involves a whole different set of problems because you're dealing with different water quality, um, you're dealing with different logistical issues, so it's a, it's a different set of problems. However, the, the key thing is um, it's a very, very linear process. You know, Basically, you start with your pre-feasibility and you never think about the, uh, the field-scale deployment until you are in the field-scale deployment period. So basically, you are focused on your pilot and facilities issue, logistic issues, 
you never think about that. You just think about small scale. And at the bigger scale, you'll figure it out later when, when it comes to it, when it, if it comes to it. So there is a big disconnect between the first part up to the pilot execution and the, the results and the, the field scale design and deployment. Very different story for uh, a typical offshore EOR project. Well, first of all, there is no such thing as a typical EOR project offshore. Um, but basically, if there was one, uh, you would start by thinking about the facilities. And even yesterday in the round tables, we were thinking, oh, no, we can do that because of the facilities, and this and that, and you can do that because of the facilities. So you always start by thinking about the facilities that are installed in the, in the field already on the platforms. So when you start by thinking about your your profitability, you have to start already to think about the final end member, the, the size of the resources and the facilities, and what about the supply chain? Am I even going to be able to do it? And that goes into the, the screening phase. So, and if you don't think you can do it with the facilities you have, then you move on and you look at something different. Um, at the lab stage, you have to bring in the ecotox because uh, of the uh, constraints in the North Sea, which are much more stringent than uh, everywhere else in the world, almost. And then the separation issues. The chemical cocktail I'm designing, is it going to be able to, um, am I going to be able to separate it easily or not? And then you have to think about the supply chain again. Those chemicals, can I bring them safely on the platform so that they can be injected? So again, very questions that normally you, you don't even worry about onshore, but offshore, uh, you have to worry about them. Then you go to the pilot design, and again, you think about the full field economics already, the separation issues, uh, health and safety, the logistics, etc., etc. So it's a very, very different um, mindset that you have to have for offshore. And, um, and basically, um, you need to think about all those things very early in the game and integrate everything, uh, facilities, separation, all those things, logistics, uh, that you wouldn't do onshore. Um, in terms of timing, uh, I thought about comparing two real polymer field, uh, fluid field cases, uh, Pelican Lake in Canada, uh, which I know quite well, uh, which is a heavy oil pilot. I will uh, describe it later on in the presentation as well. And then the Dahlia Angola by Total, uh, which is a very interesting project offshore um, because they, they thought about doing the polymer from the very beginning um, as they were planning for the development. So um, basically, um, for Pelican Lake, in terms of timing, between the, the decision to do the pilot and the pilot startup, it took about 11 months, and then uh, about nine months between the beginning of the injection to the results of the pilot, or the first result, uh, the response, and then about nine months to a, a, an additional year before they decided on the full field deployment. So in total, less than three years. Now if you compare what happened with um, Angola, well, it took seven years from the decision to look at uh, a polymer flood to the actual pilot. Uh, initially, they did some injectivity tests and, and things like that. And then three to six more years of pilot operation, um, and they are still in, in the, the operation phase and have not decided on a, an extension. So as opposed to three years, here you are looking at 10 to 16 years. So very, very different thing. Now, if I move on to the specific challenges for the North Sea, um, well, North Sea, one of the things is a very high reservoir temperature very often. Doesn't mean all the time. Um, in particular, for the heavier oil pools, temperature is not that high. But um, um, 90 degrees is something common and over uh, in the North Sea. Of course, we are using seawater for injection. Um, so a salinity of about 35 grams per liter and the hard brain. Um, we have our R plus indicator, which um, basically will look at all the cations and uh, the divalent are the bad ones for polymer and for surfactants. So um, that's a hard brain that we have to deal with. The other specificity is, of course, large well spacing. Uh, so your chemicals need to survive in the reservoir for a long time. Um, you need to work only with uh, ecotox compatible uh, chemicals. And then I talked about um, the heavy oil pools already. 
So now if I look at the existing polymers, uh, and that's uh, a rough list, um, HPAM is the standard polymer, hydrolyzed polyacrylamide. That's what we use normally. Um, it's only valid for uh, less than 80 degrees Celsius. So forget about it uh, when you're in the North Sea, mostly. Um, then you have more um, exotic polymer, um, uh, polyacrylamide with ATBS, acrylamido tertiary but butyl sulfonate, um, which goes up to 90 degrees C. And then um, uh, PAM plus ATBS plus the uh, n vinyl pyrrolidone, um, which can go apparently up to 120 degrees. Um, it's never been tested in the field yet. But when you look at the cost, uh, if the cost of uh, the HPAM, the basic HPAM is one, uh, you have the multiplier on the right hand side and uh, it's pretty scary. Uh, other polymers, the xanthan, the sclerogricans, um, biopolymers, they are valid uh, up to 90 degrees more or less, but more expensive and very sensitive to biodegradation. And then new biopolymers, the schizophilan uh, developed at the moment, uh, advertised to uh, be okay up to 135 degrees, but uh, it's never been tested on the field yet, so, and we don't know about the cost and, and other things. Um, the other thing is, um, those products here are just a powder furl. So very different. Um, as the previous speaker explained, it's easier when you are dealing with an emulsion. If you are dealing with a powder, you need to transport it, you need to slice it, you need to hydrate it, prepare a mother solution. So you need some pretty extensive facilities uh, on the platform or, or on a supply vessel. So that's an additional challenge. So now, what is the conventional thinking? Because when you talk about chemical EOR, you have two mindsets. You are either thinking about polymer or you are thinking about alkaline surfactant polymer. It's usually nothing in between. Um, and the conventional thinking is alkali, you need to have it in order to reduce your adsorption and your surfactant concentration. Uh, if you are using seawater for injection, then you're going to have to soften the water to prevent scaling. And you need to adapt your water, that's the conventional thinking, to, to improve the surfactant performances. Uh, you also very often require co-solvent to improve the solubility of, the, uh, of the, uh, the mix of the chemicals into the water. And then uh, polymer is needed for mobility control. That's what we say usually. So lots of that carries lots of risks for uh, offshore chemical EOR. Um, if your formulation is not robust, you degrade your products or you have a poor interfacial tension, you don't get the recovery you're expecting. Um, the mixing, of course, is going to be really complex. You have powder, polymer, you have alkali, you have several surfactants, you have a co-solvent. You can imagine the logistical and mixing nightmare that you're going to face. Um, you could have high adsorption, which is going to kill your economics. Um, you're going to have, obviously, uh, separation issues in the facilities when you have the surfactant and the polymer arriving in the facilities. How are you going to be able to deal with that? Uh, when we are onshore, normally we think, oh, you know, well, we'll add some more tanks or some more treaters or whatever, and we'll, we'll deal with it. But when you're on a platform, it's not possible. Then, of course, logistics, etc. So, do we have potential solutions? Because otherwise, uh, we can just pack up and go home. So, what are the potential solutions? Well, one thing that we can think about is forget about the alkali. This guy can be very useful, but it's going to cause us lots of problems with scaling, uh, transportation, and things like that. So, get rid of the alkali. That's the first step. Um, instead of thinking about adjusting your water to give the surfactant the best chances, our philosophy is more like you live with the water you get. You cannot change the water. You have to change the formulation to suit the water, not the other way around. Um, no need for co-solvent. If you do a good formulation, you shouldn't need co-solvent. And then the polymer, yeah, sometimes you need it. But if you can't have it, then you have to live without it as well. And sometimes it's not always needed. So we've been. Uh, developing lots of new products. Um, we've synthesized hundreds of new surfactants. And you've got to be careful with that one, because each time I hear that, um, the first question is, OK, I mean, everybody can synthesize a surfactant in his garage or in his backyard. Uh, but can you produce it at enough quantities at a commercial price? 
that's the big question. So we've done lots of work on that, and um, mostly we work off a base of 150 surfactants that are all commercially available and that can be made and manufactured at a, a commercial price. Uh, we are exploring new chemistries, like those AGES, the Twitterionic surfactants as well, that have their own specific properties uh, that have not really been used so far in the, in the market. And we are developing adsorption inhibitors to help us counter, um, balance the, the lack of um, not, not using uh, the alkali. Um, in order to do that, uh, we are also introducing um, a robotic equipment um, that we are using because uh, formulation involves uh, mixing two surfactants and, and varying the, the surfactants themselves, varying the proportions, the quantities of surfactants in the mix. So you have to do literally hundreds and hundreds of experiments. Um, so you know, instead of using uh, students to do that, you know, uh, we use a robot. And um, uh, robots are very nice. They never take a coffee break or anything like that. They work all day. Um, they do everything always the same way, and they handle everything. They handle the chemical mixing. They handle the capping, uncapping, vials management. They take the pictures of the, uh, of the solutions. Um, they calculate the interfacial tension. So very good guys, never striking, no problem. And in France, we, ne we need that a little bit. So um, we've developed with those robots uh, hundreds of uh, reference formulations. We call that uh, reference formulations uh, for all kinds of reservoir conditions. As you can see, um, on the x-axis, you have the salinity. And the y-axis is the temperature. Um, and then uh, the little uh, black dots or black circles represent the hard brines, and the white ones are the soft brines. So basically, we, are, we have uh, quite a, a portfolio of our um, surfactant formulations. And if you look at typical non conditions, that's where, we, where you are. Basically, 35 grams per liter, over 100 uh, centigrade in terms of reservoir temperature. So. We have solutions potentially um, for surfactants that could really um, get some good performances in terms of adsorption and in terms of uh, reducing the interfacial tension. And uh, I will show a few things on that later on. Uh, in terms of core flow results, um, those are all um, uh, result that we got for on real field cases. Um, so basically, you can see in most conditions, it's a very similar table than the one I had previously. But uh, the, the numbers in the in the little boxes correspond to um, uh, recovery of the uh, percentage recovery of the residual oil. And you see that in most cases, we get over 70% uh, incremental recovery, and, and sometimes over almost 100%. Um, so those formulations, um, again, that's totally without alkali, um, can take us really a long way. Uh, again, uh, the cross for the, uh, the North Sea conditions. So what about working with polymer? Um, well, the first thing we can see is uh, when I look at the recovery factors in the North Sea, and we got some numbers yesterday, 46%, you know, average. That's a pretty good uh, recovery factor already, which must mean something uh, in terms of sweep efficiency. The sweep efficiency must, must not be that bad. So maybe you can do it without a polymer. Not all the time. Uh, obviously, if you are dealing with heavy oil, uh, viscous oil, that could be different. But if you are dealing with lighter oil, um, maybe you can think about not using your polymer. Um, the surfactant will degrade mobility, but the polymer um, may not be required. For instance, Anxi in, um, in Malaysia, um, they did an alkali surfactant without polymer, and it seemed to be working. Um, that's significant savings in terms of capex, because you don't need to install your polymer mixing facilities. And in terms of operating costs, because you save on the cost of the polymer, the, the polymer itself, and the transportation, obviously. Uh, you still need polymer, again, for high viscosity and lower temperature where the polymer can work, such as in Captain, for instance. So now, how do you go about reducing the risk? Well, um, regarding the chemical formulation, being robust or not, you have to do hundreds of tests. There is no other way around it. Um, 
And you need to check the solubility all the time. You need to check uh, another very important factor, the impact of the dissolved gas on the, on the formulation because uh, we found out that uh, having lots of gas in your oil uh, will, will really change the, um, the behavior of the, of the surfactants. So that's something that you have to think about uh, right from the beginning as well. Um, use adsorption inhibitors to reduce your adsorption. Um, and then I'll say a word on the separation issues because that's still uh, an outstanding problem that you have to evaluate and take into consideration very early. And then reducing the absorption of the surfactant, uh, basically you've got to do it uh, by uh, choosing the right formulation. So in terms of separation issues, again, very important. Um, we have uh, started uh, a JIP called Dolphin, uh, which, in, uh, which evaluates the impact of EOR on the water cycle. So we look at uh, all the effects of uh, using produced water for the mixing of the chemicals, um, and then um, what's going to happen in the reservoir, and then what is going to happen in the surface facilities when your surfactant and your polymer come out. Um, it's an um, interesting JP. It's been, uh, now we have, I think, eight or 10 partners. Um, DEC is involved. Uh, we have Statoil, uh, Petrobras, um, Shell. So uh, quite a number of companies that are interested, into, uh, interested in EOR and want to look at those aspects, uh, which are really uh, a key um, if you want to do a, a good development offshore. And the other thing that we have, um, uh, we have a, a full uh, flow loop, uh, which can run about um, 600 barrels per day of anything, water, uh, emulsion, oil, um, so that you can test almost in full size, the impact of your surfactant, of your polymer, um, and your ability to separate those things when they come out. You can plug on um, separators, um, float, uh, f all kinds of treaters. Um, so it's a, a very useful tool, obviously, that uh, we've used in many, many studies um, on several projects. So now, um, Pushing the limits, it's uh, what I call pushing the limits. It's uh, just a couple examples. Um, and the first one is um, going to be uh, onshore, of course, because there are not so many projects offshore again. Um, surfactant polymer in a hard brain. And it's a published example. So basically, why I took this example, um, as you can see, the temperature is very different from the North Sea, only 40 degrees Celsius. Um, but uh, the thing is, uh, the, vis the sorry, the, um, uh, the water salinity is quite comparable. It varies between 23 to 43 grams per liter. And then in terms of uh, hardness, uh, the brine um, that they have in this reservoir is even harder than what we are facing within the North Sea. So if we can do it there, uh, there is a good chance that we can do it in North Sea conditions. So that's the, the typical result from uh, from the, uh, you know, the formulation, again, uh, mixing two surfactants together. Um, the top graph is, uh, you know, the, the little vials where you try to see your emulsion. Uh, so you have um, model oil, you have water, um, and surfactant. And what you are trying to achieve is what you get uh, on the right-hand side, um, which is uh, the, um, the micro emulsion at the interface between the oil and the water. Uh, the robot uh, allows us to calculate the interfacial tension. That's what's displayed on the bottom. Uh, and what we are trying to achieve in that case, because the, the reservoir and the water um, injected have a, a quite wide range of variations, we are trying to achieve uh, good interfacial tensions in a wide range of salinities between 26 and 43 gr or 42 grams per liter. And then. Um, at the same time, we always check the solubility of the products because the product uh, surfactant composition uh, has to be able to uh, be transported without precipitating. So you have to have it um, working at surface condition and as well, obviously, at reservoir conditions because you don't want it to precipitate in the reservoir. So it's something we always check um, as a routine, of, of course. Um, in terms of reducing adsorption, those are some of the, um, the results on the recovery and the adsorption. So basically, um, um, uh, recoveries are the numbers at the top. Um, 
and then the, the adsorption is uh, are the numbers um, at the bottom. Um, so you see that uh, if you are dealing with soft, if you were dealing with, with soft water, you would get a quite low adsorption, 0 0.09 milligram per gram, uh, which is very low. Um, now with the harder water, it's a different story. You get lower adsorption because, uh, sorry, higher adsorption. And uh, as you get higher adsorption, um, you don't get the same recovery because your surfactant, instead of uh, reducing interfacial tension, is busy getting adsorbed on the rock. So uh, using the adsorption inhibitors and other techniques, um, you can uh, manage to reduce the adsorption uh, to 0.15 milligram per gram of rock and uh, get a, a recovery of 87% on the cores. And uh, going from an adsorption of 0.25 to 0.15 um, doesn't seem like a big, uh, big uh, success. But um, if you take a, a standard oil field of 100 barrels, 100 million barrels, uh, that would correspond to a saving uh, of uh, almost 100 million uh, British pounds. And that doesn't take, of course, the incremental recovery into consideration. Um, the other um, topic I want to uh, discuss a little bit as well, uh, and it's another, um, another uh, field study, uh, a heavy oil polymer flood in Canada. Um, and I wanted to put this one in because, first of all, it's one of the very few uh, full-scale uh, deployment of polymer flood. Uh, that's the uh, higher viscosity polymer flood uh, in the world as well. And uh, I wanted to put that because there are lots of fields in the North Sea with heavier oil. So, uh, of course, the challenges are different, but uh, let's see uh, whether there is any chance of doing something. Um, so, main reservoir characteristics, you know, not everything is interesting on that uh, graph. But I would draw your attention to the thickness of the reservoir. Sorry, I went too far. Um, only five meters on the average, so it's pretty thin. Um, good perm, very big reservoir, six billion barrels in place. Uh, low temperature, it's Canada, so it's never very warm over there. And uh, shallow on top of that. Um, but uh, the important number is the one at the bottom, uh, viscosity of uh, between 800 to 80,000. So um, that's pretty viscous, and uh, when it's cold, it's not moving very much. So the pilot, um, again, all horizontal wells in that, f in that pool. Uh, it's the only way the development was made commercial. Uh, very simple patterns. You have two injection wells in blue, and then uh, three uh, uh, um, producers in, in green. Uh, all, the all, all the wells sorry, are 1,500 meter long horizontals, uh, spacing of about 175 meters. and. Um, and uh, it's quite typical for, uh, for pattern in, in, in the field. Uh, we used a very standard HPAM for that one um, because, again, the temperature uh, and the water quality are, are really mild. So, of course, very different from uh, what you have uh, in a high temperature in the North Sea. And we injected about 20, 20 centipoids. Um, Something missing here on that slide is uh, the polymer pilot was done in an area where the oil viscosity is about 1,500 centipoids, 1,500 centipoids. So it's pretty viscous, but not up to the 80,000 that we can see in other places in the reservoir. Um, there has been no water injection prior, uh, just primary production and then right into uh, the polymer flood. And um, I'm just going to show the results of... Uh, uh, the central well, the one which is confined with one injector on both sides, and um, the other, the, the, it's been published, so you can find uh, the other wells. Um, the results are not as good because they have only one injector. But basically, uh, you can see that uh, production in green, um, oil rates in barrels per day started around 97, 250 barrels per day, a very quick decline because there is absolutely no energy in the reservoir, it's heavy oil, no aquifer, no dissolved gas in the, in the oil. So very quick decline. Um, and then we started the injection in uh, May 2006. And as you can see, nine months later, um, you get uh, uh, a quite sharp increase in the oil rate. You go up to 350, 300 barrels a day. And then continuing to inject your polymer solution for many years, You're st we are still injecting at the moment. Uh, and the oil rate has gone down. 
but uh, we are still in the 150 to 200 barrels a day. Um, the other interesting thing on that figure is um, the fact that the water cut goes up, obviously, but uh, compared to uh, a water flood pilot that had gone on in the field before, where they went up to a 90, 95% water cut almost right away, after eight years of injection, we are still in the 60% range for water cut. So clearly, you have to recycle much less water, um, and uh, that's a big saving on the operating expenses um, and a big saving for the environment. So it's, uh, it's really uh, much better than a, a standard water flood. I was just in the process of showing the, uh, the extension of um, the polymer flood to the whole field. Uh, it's uh, an older slide, uh, but they've continued putting, uh, as you can see, the development. Uh, it's all horizontal wells and uh, about, you know, six or seven hundred of them. And um, they have uh, um, extended the polymer flood uh, using skids and they've done it in phases. Uh, and it's been responding really, really well all over the field. Um, I just have a couple more slides. Uh, the, this one is I wanted to show you uh, something uh, a little bit special that we did using a multilateral well as well. Same reservoir, obviously, horizontal multilateral with five legs. And then uh, they drilled um, injection wells, horizontal injection wells between the legs uh, and put them in uh, under polymer flood. Again, no water flood prior. And uh, those are the results. So the same kind of behavior, um, multilateral well, about 10 kilometers in the reservoir. So uh, about 600 barrel in, in barrels per day initial production. And then you can see when uh, we start injecting the polymer, about six to nine months later, we have the um, increase in production up to high 100 barrels a day. And then when they started injecting again, uh, put the, the other wells in, under a polymer flood, again, um, a kick in the oil rate up to 900, almost a thousand barrels a day, and then, um, and then uh, the water cut is still very low uh, after uh, four or five years of injection, still in the 40 to 50 percent. Um, this well has cumed over 2.1 million barrels uh, of oil, and um, for again, it's uh, about 2,000 centipoise in this area of the field, so it's a pretty good number. That's one of the best wells in Canada. Um, especially in such a heavy oil. So uh, that's it. Um, only the conclusions remain. As uh, we know, there has been little uh, chemical EOR experience offshore. Um, there are tough challenges, especially in the North Sea with the temperature and uh, the older platforms. Um, and integration is essential, especially for the facilities. But uh, all hope is not lost. Um, we have to forget about the old uh, ASP approach, I think, uh, in many cases, and uh, try for a simpler approach um, uh, using new technologies, new surfactants, um, and a new approach. Um, when you are dealing with high temperature reservoirs, probably we need to forget about the alkali and the polymer, uh, especially the polymer, because uh, um, Polymer that can withstand high temperature is very, very expensive. And if you are dealing with, you know, low viscosity oil, you can do without the polymer. And for the higher viscosity stuff like Captain, uh, Bentley, and others, um, then polymer could be an option. Normally, those fields, the temperature is not as high, so the uh, H pump could work. And um, it's, you know, it's uh, feasible. We've we've proved it. And, uh, but we still have to think about the separation because um, it's all good and well um, when you have only one well producing polymer, but when you start having hundreds of wells producing polymer at the same time, it can create a bit of a mess in the facilities. So it's something that you have to plan ahead for and be ready when it hits. That's it now, uh, questions, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you, thank you very much, Alex.